I have to apologize. I'm not used to using a microphone, but this is a very long room. One of the other problems with it being a very long room is that I'm not entirely certain where all of you are. Um, I know that people have been asking this in this room all day, but if you could come down. If you could come down out of the back. But that's okay too. That's okay too. Unfortunately, I don't know if we have enough people here for this experiment to make sense, but I wanted to start with an experiment. Um, mostly what I do these days, I used to be a blogger, but I no longer am to any degree of which I can usefully claim. Most of what I do these days is this sort of thing, standing in front of a bunch of people and talking to them. So I was curious, is there, is there anyone in the audience who has difficulty doing this, if you could stand up? Standing in front of people and talking to them. Okay, so is, is there anybody in this audience who has difficulty doing this that would like to get better at it? If you, if you want nothing to do with it, just sit, sit back down. Okay, so I have, I have a theory and I have an offer. And my theory goes something like this. There's a lot of things that are very difficult about doing what I'm doing right now standing on a stage and talking to a bunch of people. This is a real-time endeavor. This is, this, is, this is a little bit spooky. Um, it takes a lot of planning, it takes a lot of attention, it takes a lot of intention. But one of the things that is difficult about this is that there's an awful lot of information coming at me right now because I am not used to, we are none of us used to, looking at all of these faces, paying attention to them. And my theory is that this is something that we can learn to be better at through experience. My offer is, I have a chair. So if anybody would like to spend this presentation sitting in that chair, looking out there, although I don't think anybody's interested in doing that. Okay, that was my experiment. It backfired on me terribly. That is okay. I'd like to start with a story about a plane. And the problem with that is that stories about planes generally involve planes that have something wrong with them. The story is no exception. And there may be people in the audience that have worries, not unfounded, about planes that have something wrong with them. There may be people in the audience today that might be getting on a plane later. Please allow me this small spoiler. Everything works out in the end. This is the story of the Gimli Glider. A couple of decades ago, uh, there was a 767, unnamed, that flew as part of Air Canada's airline fleet. And it had a regular route. It flew from Montreal to Ottawa to Edmonton. And it had a problem. 767s have two fuel gauges. And one of them was broken on this particular plane. So if you looked at the fuel gauges, you couldn't say for sure which of the ones was correct and which of the ones was, I mean, I'm leaving some things out, but that was functionally the problem. They couldn't trust the fuel gauges in the plane. So they had a way around this. What they would do is they would send someone out onto the wing of the plane with a stick and they would do this thing where they would stick the stick into the wing and figure out where the level of the fuel was in the wing and the fuel tank. And from that measurement, that linear measurement, they could look in the book that they had um, there on the tarmac and figure out the weight of the fuel that they had. And then they could use the weight of the fuel that they had to understand the range of the plane. And the problem was, in the book that they used, the formula in the book that they were using to figure this out was wrong. And they thought it was telling them pounds it was telling them kilograms. So they actually had about half as much fuel as they thought they did. But they didn't know that. So they took off. And they took off out of Montreal and they landed in Ottawa. And the fuel gauges were still broken. But that's okay. Because they have this test that they do with this stick and they put it in the wing. And they were using the same formula that they were using back in Montreal. They thought they had twice as much fuel as they had. So they're flying merrily along towards Edmonton at a cruising altitude of about 41,000 feet. 
over the Canadian Rockies. Very, very pretty. And all of a sudden, the right engine fails because it has run out of fuel. And they look out the window at the right engine and they say, well, okay, we're fine because we can still make it to Winnipeg with just the left engine. And then the left engine fails because they've run out of fuel. And they suddenly find themselves in what is essentially a vaguely aerodynamic brick descending at about 2,000 feet per minute. They're at 41,000 feet. They have about 20 minutes. But they're over the Canadian Rockies, so they have about 16 minutes. And the very first thing that they do is they get on the radio and they call Winnipeg and they tell them what's going on. The second thing they do is they, pull, they push this little thing out of the side of the plane. It's called a rat. It's a little turbine. It pokes out of the side of the plane. And the wind rushing by the plane spins it up and provides a little bit of power to the plane's systems. Now, normally what this is for is to restart the engines in case of high altitude flame out. If you fly the plane too high, there's not enough air to keep the engine running, and the engine will stall. That wasn't their problem. Their problem was they had no fuel. But the rat did do one other thing. It gave them enough power to get the avionics back up, and it gave them enough power so that their pneumatics would start working again, which gave them their control surfaces back. So now they're in a vaguely aerodynamic glider descending at about 2,000 feet per minute. Now it just so happens, on that flight that day, the person in the pilot's chair, in his free time, was a very, very enthusiastic amateur glider pilot. So we had someone in the plane that knew how to fly it. But they really didn't know where to go. They, they didn't have any good place to land. Winnipeg was too far. They knew they only had about 15 minutes of glide time before they had to get someplace. It turns out that the person in the co-pilot's chair was ex-Canadian Air Force. And he used to be stationed at a Canadian Air Force base at Gimli, which is a tiny little outpost in the middle of the Canadian Rockies, very conveniently close by decommissioned Air Force Base. So nobody else would have known about it, except for this guy in the co-pilot's chair. So they know where they're going, and they know what to do. They call up Winnipeg and they say, we're going to Gimli, send what you can. Now one of the things that they had to do in the next 15 minutes was lose some speed. And the way that you do this is with something called a slip maneuver, which is not something that you'd normally do in a 767. It's not something that you'd normally do as a normal pilot. What you do is you throw the yoke to one side, and you throw the rudder to the other, and you sort of turn the plane around so it's pancaking its way through the air. There were two problems with this. The first was, when you turn the plane so that it's pancaking through, pancaking through the air, it's a little bit unclear if there's still going to be enough air coming through the turbine that you'll still have enough power to power the hydraulics so that you have the control surfaces, so that you can get the plane out of the maneuver and back into level flight. They didn't know. No one had tried this before. The other thing they didn't know was whether or not a 767 airframe can like, hold together in the stress of one of these maneuvers. They didn't know. No one had tried this before. It turns out it did and it can. So now they've lost speed. The next thing they need to do is lower the landing gear. Okay, so the rear landing gear folds out and folds back. That's perfect. The plane's moving through the air. The onrushing air will grab the landing gear, lock it into position. The front landing gear folds out forward. This is a problem. They do not have enough hydraulics to lock the front landing gear. But that's okay. They have back landing gear. That's most of the problem. They'll have to land like that. So they make their way in their one and only chance to land at the very large military runway at Gimli Air Force Base, the decommissioned Gimli Air Force Base, which was at the moment being used by the good people of Gimli for Gimli Family Fun Days. And one of the things that they had done was they had put a highway barrier right down the middle of the tarmac because they were running a go-kart race up and down the tarmac, you know, one lap up and down. So there are about 40 go-karts doing laps up and down one way. 
when all of a sudden, out of the sky, comes a 767 coming in for a very hot, very quiet landing. And about 40 go-karts go flying off in every direction. They get the rear landing gear down, and that works out very, very well. And they put on the brakes, and they bring the front landing gear down, and the front landing gear buckles. And the front of the plane comes down on the barrier, and the hydraulic fluid ignites, and the front of the plane bursts into flames. At which point, 40 go-karts, each with their own fire extinguisher, comes racing back in to put out the fire. The only injury sustained in all of this was one poor unfortunate soul who was deplaning down the exit ramp in the rear of the plane because the plane was decanted so much, well, decanted, the plane was canted so much that the rear ramps were nearly vertical. Everything else was fine. They eventually fixed it, it eventually flew again. One final touch. If you remember the emergency vehicles that they sent, well, they only sent one, the emergency vehicle they sent from Winnipeg up to Gimli to help. About halfway there, it ran out of gas. <laughs> so I'm going to talk about a couple of things. Um, I'm going to try to introduce the topic, talk about the topic, and then move on to the next topic. I'm from academia. This is how this works. The first thing I'd like to talk about is shape. Stories have shape. Um, stories have beginnings. Stories have endings. And stories have a path that runs along the middle between the beginning and the ending. And I could babble a lot about all of these things, but I don't have that much time, so I will try to be brief and give things that I've discovered to be useful in my own efforts at, at producing this sort of material. One good way to look for the beginning is to remove stuff from the front of the story until you can't anymore. And when you get to that point, look at what is now the beginning of the story. Look at it very, very carefully and see if you can figure out how to make that where you start. One thing I can say about endings is that they're a little bit more tricky. What you're doing is you're looking for something that has closure, something that has fullness, something that makes it very, very clear to the audience that now is the time to stop. One of the ways that you can do this is you can use a coda. You can find some thread, some theme in the story and have a slight echo at the end, like, for example, running out of gas. In the middle, the stories have slope. And the stories are either going up or down. The stories are getting better or worse. Well, better or worse things are happening to the people and things in the story. The thing you want to avoid, I think, is having no slope at all. Try to keep your story moving either up or down at any given point in time. If it's moving flat, then nothing is happening. The other thing to be a little bit careful of, and I have less good advice here, is to keep the slope of the story from being too extreme. The problem with that is that if you have an extreme slope and your story goes somewhere very, very quickly, then it's going to be very, very difficult to get out of it later. So be mindful of shape. Mechanics. A lot of this isn't going to be useful to some of you, and I apologize for that. I used to be a blogger, and that is mostly the written word. Although I imagine that some of you in this room are video bloggers or podcasters. And I would argue that one of the things that is most important in video casting or, or video casting or podcasting is your voice. So one of the things that I've learned about doing this is it's very, very important to support your voice. And the easiest way to do that is to try different ways of doing the thing that you do. I imagine that most of the time, you're going to be doing something like sitting in a comfortable chair. It's comfortable. It's also a little bit difficult in ways that you may not know. To give you some idea of this, 
the next time you use your voice to make a podcast or to do a video blog, try doing the line flat on your back. It'll be very, very difficult indeed. It's worth trying. It's worth trying to understand why it's difficult. Then try it in your chair. And then try it on a chair with no back. And see what that does to your voice. Try it standing up. Try it standing up like this. Have your feet apart. Have your shoulders above your feet. In general, try to form a good platform for your voice. Try to have a stable foundation underneath the thing that powers your voice. And you may discover that you can do things that you did not know that you could do otherwise. In fact, let's see if I can make this work. You might be able to project in ways that you didn't think you could, although I'm not sure this is going to work, because this is a really long thing. So I'm going to go back to using the microphone. The other thing that I found to be very, very, very useful, and, and this may or may not be useful to you, is the place where you make the thing that you make. Um, I do most of my creative work in one particular spot. I know it very well. I have it set up in a very particular way. I do this for a very particular reason. I want the place where I work to be as boring as possible. And things usually get boring when you become very familiar with them. The reason I want it to be as boring as possible is I want it to be less interesting than the thing I'm trying to create. Because generally, when you're trying to create something, it's really, really difficult. And I am lazy, and I want to do something easier. Like fiddle with my coffee cup. Or anything else. So try to set up the place where you create so that it is very simple, very well known, and very, very boring. Mechanics. Audience. You are my audience. I am here on this stage. I am talking to you. I am trying very, very hard to make as good a connection as I can with all of you. In some ways, this is very, very difficult. As I mentioned at the top, there's a lot of information coming at me. This is very nerve-wracking. I am very, very nervous. But it's good, because I have something to connect with. I can look out on these faces, and I can know that I am interacting with you on some level. In social media, that can get a little bit more difficult, because you don't often have good insight into who's listening to your podcast, or who's watching your video blog, or who's reading the words that you write. So there are two audiences in this room. There are you, and there's another one, the model audience, the audience that I have in my head. And let me see if I can explain the worth of that. Back in the late 80s, there was a band called the Bangles, and they were very talented, uh, a quartet of young women, um, some would say very attractive too, they did an excellent cover of Hazy Shade of Winter on the Less Than Zero soundtrack. You probably are more likely to know them by their song about walking like an Egyptian, although I've never actually known any Egyptians to walk that way. The lead singer, Susanna Hoffs, and you can see her do this in the Walk Like an Egyptian video, did this thing whenever she was performing. She would stop, and she would look to stage right, and she would look to stage left, and then she would look out into the distance. It was very, very alluring. And it made many people think that she was very, very attractive. And eventually the band broke up, as bands do. And one of the stories that circulated after the band broke up was that the other band members were, you know, unhappy with how Susanna Hoffs was doing this thing and garnering all this attention for herself when it wasn't about her, it was about the band. That turned out to be completely wrong. She wasn't doing it to be alluring. She was doing it because she was terrified. She's in the, on a stage, bright lights, 50,000 people in a room staring at her, wanting her to do well, 
so that they could be they, they could do well. And what she was doing was that she would find one person in the audience, and then a second person in the audience, and then a third person way out there in the audience, and she would perform to them, those three people, because those were the three people that she could handle. And she knew that she was going to be able to give a good performance to those three people. And by giving a good performance to those three people, she would be able to perform well for everyone else in that room. Now, if you're sitting alone in a room and you're creating things for your audience, it's good to have a model audience to create for. And some members of my model audience are in this room today, some are not. But I'm definitely trying to do well by them. I chose them very, very carefully. I should know them well, I should trust them, and I should expect them to expect me to do the best that I can. If you can find people like that, when you blog or video log or podcast, podcast to them. If it helps, put a picture on the wall. Or even better, if they're around, unless you're a blogger, I suppose. If you're around, have them sit in on some of your sessions. Audience. And the last, and I think, I think the most important thing that I want to talk about today is education. I think this is incredibly important. I think it's, it's, it's an incredibly important component of storytelling. Because stories can be good. Stories can be great. Stories can be great because of plot. Stories can be great because of character. Stories can be great because of description. But the really, really, really great ones the really, really, really good ones are things that leave you with something. As an example, hopefully everyone in this room now knows that if they need a fire extinguisher, they can go find a go-kart. I'm not saying that that's going to be likely, but of the list of places to look for a fire extinguisher in an emergency, go-kart, hopefully, is now on that list. And that's a list that you want to be as long as possible. I'll give you another example. There is a woman named Teresa Lust. I am not making this up. She is an author. She writes books about food. And one of the books about food that she has written is a little thing called Pass the Polenta. It is a collection of essays about food, experiences with food. It's available in the Carnegie Public Library. It is highly recommended. In the title story, she tells this story of this young couple, husband and wife. And they're just newly married, I think a couple months, maybe half a year. And they happen to be in the neighborhood up there in the Pacific Northwest on a rainy winter's evening of the wife's mother, the husband's mother-in-law. So they decide to drop in and pay a visit. The mother is aghast, absolutely aghast, because she comes from a time and a place when you have visitors, you put your best on the table. Hospitality is all. But all she has is some polenta, and some leftover stew, and some cheese in the larder. And she's terribly embarrassed to serve this. So goes the story. And then, the author goes ahead and tells us what they did for dinner that night. You have stew, and you have cheese, you have a plate of cheese, you have a couple of different kinds of cheese, you have a melting cheese like a mozzarella, and you've got a table cheese like an asiago, and you've got a blue cheese, this is important, it goes well with the corn, the polenta, a blue cheese like a gorgonzola. And you have these out on a plate. And you have a bowl of parmigiano reggiano over there that's grated, because you always do. So when you're getting ready to eat dinner, you grab a bowl, and you go to the polenta, and you put polenta in your bowl. And then you go to the cheese, and you put pieces of cheese on the polenta, and they start to melt into the polenta. And then you go to the stew, and you ladle stew over the cheese, and then you go to the parmesan reggiano and put it on top. 
And what you end up with is a bowl that chases winter away because everything begins to mix and everything begins to melt and everything comes together and it's warm and it's hearty and it's filling and it's good and surprising too because you don't remember where you put the cheese. And it was revelatory to the husband who had never experienced this kind of food. And the reason why Ms. Ellis told this story is because the husband and the wife were her mother and father. And it established her in this place where she was telling stories about her life and past histories. What I got out of this story was that I really, really needed to learn how to make stew. And I needed to learn how to make polenta. And I needed to understand a lot more about cheese so that someday I would be able to make this meal and eat that food. And I knew that I would never forget how to make that meal. And now, I imagine, neither will many of you. <coughs> Education. And I'd like to finish today with three small stories about Pittsburgh. And just for my edification, if I could see uh, hands as to who is reasonably new to the area. One year, two years, okay. So if you've never really experienced a winter here, I will say wool socks. Wool socks are vital. Um, but also, these three stories in a small way are for you folks, so that you have some idea of what you've gotten yourself into. And the first story is about an elderly woman and her dog. So I live in Greenfield. I live actually quite close to where the after party is. And I moved in in about 2006. And it took a while to set up the house. So one of the things that I was doing at the end of every day was walking to the front door, grabbing a handful of dimes out of the jar that was sitting on the table, and walking out to the local paper box to buy myself a copy of the daily paper. And one of the days when I had done that, I was walking back to the house, and I encountered on the sidewalk an elderly woman who was walking her dog. And she looked at me, and she said, hello. I had lived in Shadyside before that, and that was very confusing to me. <laughs> and I said, hello. And she looked at me and said, you're new around here. And I said, yeah, I just bought a house up on the hill. And she said, do you work around here? And I said, sure, I work at Carnegie Mellon. And she said, oh, you have to be pretty smart to work at Carnegie Mellon. I bet you're German or Jewish or something. And, and I said, no, 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 I'm neither of those things. And she said, well, I'm just a silly old Irish Catholic. What would I know? And I said, but, but I'm, I'm half Irish. And she looked at me. And she said, well, the other half must be German or Jewish or something. <laughs> and I, I said, no, 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 no. I'm, I'm, I'm Irish Estonian. And she reached out her hand. And she patted my arm, and she said, you show them. <laughs> the second story is about fireworks. Pittsburgh loves its fireworks. Greenfield is no exception. Every year, if we can afford it, we put on a fireworks show as part of the Greenfield Parade. The fireworks are launched over a gas station. So far, nothing has gone wrong. But it's also a very good place to watch the fireworks. Not necessarily the fireworks downtown, but you can walk along the ridge lines and you can look out to the south and you can see the fireworks of all the municipalities blossoming over the, the tops of the hills. So I was doing that in 2007, walking along the ridge lines. And I come across, walking down the road, and I come across an intersection where there is a clan of men. 
They were all wearing work boots. They were all wearing jeans. They were all wearing white t-shirts. They were obviously all of a family. And they are standing in a circle around the center of the intersection where they have nailed a three-inch firework mortar to the asphalt. And the man who is obviously the patriarch is rooting through this box and he comes up with this firework shell. And everyone backs up. And he walks over to the mortar, he lights the shell, and he drops it in the mortar, and he stands back. One of the really, really nice things about small towns is that when you go to see a small town firework show, you can be right underneath the fireworks. And it's very loud, and it's very impressive, and it's, it's very, very pretty. And this was very loud, and very impressive, and very, very pretty. And we all watched this firework go off right above our heads. And then they all stopped and they turned to look out over the valley to the opposing ridge line. And then they waited. And a minute later, someone with a firework mortar <laughs> nailed to some other intersection on some other street, launched a firework into the air, pop and sparkle. And they all turned to each other and went back to the box. The third story is the story of the time that I met Mr. Rogers. I do not know if you are familiar with the Oakland section of the city, in particular Forbes Avenue, where it intersects with South Craig Street. There is a Starbucks there. And it did not always used to be a Starbucks. It used to be a Unimart. A friend of mine used to be the assistant manager of that Unimart. This was back in the mid-90s. And one of the things about that Unimart that was very, very interesting was that it was a very good place to watch the marathon on, Sunday, on the Sunday morning that they held the marathon. Because you could sit on the stoop and you could look all the way down Forbes into Oakland, down by the towers, where the runners would come around the corner. And you could watch the runners come all the way up Forbes until they got to the barricades at South Craig Street, where they would turn and go off toward Shadyside. So on Marathon Sunday, I would go up to the inner park to keep my friend company and help out where I could, and occasionally sit on the stoop and watch the events unfold around me. And I was sitting there on the stoop, looking over to the barricades, and there were four women setting up before the race started. They had lawn chairs. One of them had a set of binoculars. One of them had a copy of the Sunday paper. And two of them had legal pads and pens. And I was watching them, trying to make sense of this, when Mr. Rogers came around the corner. I'm looking up at Mr. Rogers. And I said hello, and he said hello. And then he went into the Unimart. And then he came out of the Unimart, and I happened to be standing, so I was able to hold the door open for him. And I said, are you going to stay and watch the marathon? And he said, no, no, I have things to do. And then he walked up South Craig Street, and we all waited for the start of the race. When we understood what those women were doing, in their lawn chairs, behind the barricade. The race started, and we were all waiting for the runners to come up Forbes Avenue. And when the first runner rounded that turn, the woman all stood up, and the one with the binoculars read off their number on their, on their placard. And the woman with the paper found that number and read off everything else in the paper to the women with the legal pads. And the reason they were doing that was so that by the time all of those runners came up to the barricade to make that turn onto South Craig Street, every single one of them, if they were from the other side of town or the other side of the world, every single one of them had someone cheering them on by name. Thank you. And I don't know what 
time it is. But I think we have time for some questions. Um, I was thinking this was the branding workshop. <laughs> oh, oh, good heavens. Oh, I'm sorry. No, unfortunately the branding person is ill. And, and Norm tweeted that he moved me in here. So I'm very, very, very apologetic if any of you are confused as to what you just watched. <laughs> so what did we just watch? Oh, Sorry. 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 This was storytelling. I guess there were three audiences then, right? <laughs> no, at least. <laughs> and and, and so, let, so let's see. So we would have... And I should say, I'm not entirely certain that this was, this was very much an outlier talk. Um, this was not a talk that dealt with business. This was not a talk that dealt with SEO. But from what I understand of what little I understand of communication, thinking about your audience, thinking about presentation technique, thinking about the shape of the things that you say, these are all facets, these are all part of it. And unfortunately, as I said in the, in the abstract, a lot of it comes from practice, just relentless practice. And I'm not sure there's any better advice I can have than that. Well, and, oh, go ahead. Yeah, I'm thinking um, if you're writing a blog, this is sort of a blogging kind of a event, uh, activity, and storytelling is so important. You know, it's like people love stories and they gravitate to stories. And like you open with the story of the airplane. Is there anything that you could share with us about story that's, um, that we could really grab onto in terms of as a way of getting our words down on paper in a way that holds people, grabs people's attention and holds them. So, so you're asking where to find good stories? No, how okay. to produce them. Oh, okay. So I'm not, I'm not sure I entirely understand. And I apologize. So techniques for, for starting stories well? That is, would be is the, one. Is that the question? That, that would be one. And how to hold on to people, how to hold them through what you're writing. Well, so the first thing to do is to make sure that all of the people in your audience expect to be there. <laughs> or else they may leave and confuse you. Um, so, I think, I, think part of it, I think part of it is the thing about shape. I think that you want something to be getting, and there's, there's a vast amount of thought about this. Um, there's Aristotle and a whole bunch of folks after him. But modern writers, people ready for 30 year olds today. Well, so, uh, so like specifics of subject, specifics of topic. I think syntax. Syntax. Speak in straight lines. <laughs> Try not to include conditionals unless you absolutely must. Um, there's, there's a bunch of things here. Uh, there is a notion that the front end of your sentence, the subject, should be made as short as possible. And the verbs that you choose should be made as active as possible. We think best, we understand best when we have, um, well, so let me, delve into this a little bit. We all have about 15 seconds of short-term memory. And what that gets us is about 15 seconds worth of time where it's very, very easy for us to pull things out that we've just heard. So if you're talking about a thing, like say, a cow, then you may want to make sure that you mention the cow in the first 15 seconds of a sentence, or the first 15 words, or the very, very beginning. And one of the ways that you can do that is you can make the subject of, of any given sentence. And this expands out to things like paragraphs, articles. 
you want to make the subject of a given sentence as short as possible so that your audience, in reading the first sentence or hearing the sentence, immediately has something concrete to grab onto. And then you can start planting stuff on top of that. You can put a verb on top of that. You can put direct objects on top of that. You can start stacking clauses after clauses after clauses after clauses, much like these, on the end of the sentence. Could you give us some examples? I'm desperately trying to think of some. <laughs> and it's a little bit it's a little bit difficult right now because um, I'm trying to do that and talk about it at the same time. And and make sure that this microphone, which I'm not used to, does not, you know, end up stuck in my uh, anyway. Um, so so uh, examples. What would be a really crappy um, subject to a sentence? And how could you pretty it up? Well, let's see. The cow that I had known since the beginning of my days, back when I was a youth in Belgium, that was, and, and so you could do a big long subject like that, and that's a little bit ridiculous. But if you just say the cow, and then if we pick a verb, so let's say the cow died. Died. Okay, so. The, the cow that, that I knew from my days in my youth, when I lived back in Belgium, on top of the sausage plant, died. <laughs> it is unclear, by the end of that sentence, what the hell I'm talking about. Because the cow is so far gone, that it has fallen out of your short-term memory. If I say, the cow died, then that's, that's much easier, much easier to hang on to. And what I'm trying to, and the reason why I'm stopping and pausing here is I'm now trying to think about how I can turn the rest of that sentence into something that we can stick on the end of the sentence. This is the sort of thing that is reasonably useful in keeping something moving. Um, the other thing that you want to be careful of is conditionals. You don't want to have people holding a bunch of stuff in their heads so if you say something like, well, so one of the things that you can do is you can go to Step Check this afternoon and you can walk up and down the stairs at the South Side Slopes and look upon great vistas. Or you can come here to Podkin Pittsburgh and sit in an auditorium with red chairs with bright lights and a reasonable sound system. And if there's a decision point at the beginning of that sentence, that decision point is going to get lost because now everyone's juggling between these two things. If you say, this afternoon, we could decide to go to Step Track or Pod Camp. And then say, Step Track is a thing that doesn't involve any cows whatsoever. Oddly enough, neither does Pod Camp. <laughs> so if you structure things in that way, so if you make them very, very simple from start, and then add complexity later, that makes it much easier to follow. If you have each unit of what you're doing be self-contained, so that you don't have a sentence that has three or four ideas in it. Give each sentence its own idea. Give each paragraph its own idea. And if you have to have a story that has multiple ideas in it, then give each idea a section. And then use the front matter and the back matter to tie it all together. Hopefully that was helpful. Did that, was that at all helpful? There, yeah. Okay. Do you teach creative writing or? No, unfortunately, I am in IT. <laughs> I was going to say, that was an interesting little example, I think. You must, you, you, do you write? Do you blog? Do you? I used to. Yeah, okay. Unfortunately, I no longer do. I'm, I'm looking to get back to it. This is, this is, for better or worse, part of that road. Um, there was a question. I wanted to say, even though you said you weren't going to talk about search engine optimization, I think you sort of just did what you talked about the use of the first 15 seconds. Um, but more to the point about your audience, given that A, you used to be a blogger and now you're doing this wonderful thing, and there are lots of people here who write either on paper or virtually or speak via video, uh, etc. There are a lot of ways to say that message, and sometimes you change because your audience is in a different media. Can you talk about how you tweak that for them, if you will, or how that idea of that modern audience changes? 
how does the story change if you will? So the, the question was, how does the story change depending on the media that's used? And they all have different strengths. Um, one of my one of the strengths and and difficulties of this particular format is that it is very much an on the edge sort of thing. It's very real time. It's very insistent. Um, and that's both good and bad for both you and me. Um, the the amount that I the amount that I need to do to hold your attention is very high, but the reward is also very very high. Um, and with I think there's some of that in blogging too. Now with blogging and blogging and particularly with with, with blogging and podcast and blogging. And particularly with, with, with blogging and podcasting, particularly with blogging, we do get to edit. And I think that's a big difference. I don't get to edit up here. I wish that I could. I don't get to edit up here. And um, that's that's big because there's a lot of there's a lot of refactoring, there's a lot of rewriting, and rewriting is huge. I would recommend rewriting everything that you're putting out at least twice if you have the time. And no one ever does, and I never do. But um, I usually find that after the third time through, I actually understand what I'm trying to say, and that's that's very very big. Um, but I think a lot of it is also focus. When you're doing a video blog, you have one very limited channel. You have your face and whatever the camera's pointed at. It's a very rich channel. There's sight, there's sound, there's motion. Um, and which is very important. Uh, yes, if I can just diverge a little bit here, there's an old ball field trick. Um, and this is good if you're if you're a video blogger. So if I want to point to this water, I can point to this water. I can point to this water. I can use motion to point to the water. Or I can point to the water. And that third thing, that motion on a curve, that's far more interesting to the parts of your brain that track motion. And it's not anything that you 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 recognize consciously, um, but it's something that definitely works. So try it. The next time you want to point to something, point on a curve, see if people are more interested. So you get you get to do things like that when you have a video camera. When you have audio, you don't get motion, but you get more atmosphere. You have the ability to add music. You have the ability to add sound. You can make, and it's a lot of work, and maybe not useful for every application, but you can make the work the media immersive in ways that you can't with video. Because in, in um, podcasting, excuse me, podcasting is a little bit of a middle ground here. Because just by using audio, you're encouraging your audience to supply the visuals themselves. And that's great for you because they're doing your work. And the visuals they come up with are going to be far more meaningful and compelling to them than anything that you're going to be able to do unless you are really, really, really good. And I'm not. So I let them do that as much as I can, particularly for blogging. <laughs> because with blogging, all you have is text, which means that all of the, you know, all of the stuff, all of the ambiance, all of the background, most of the details, all of that is going to be supplied by the audience in their imaginations. And that's difficult. It's difficult to do that well. It's difficult to subvert your audience to do your work for you on such a grand scale. But it's extraordinarily rewarding because then their experience is astonishing.
Plus, I, I, don't, I don't think blogging is as expensive. Did, was that a useful answer? OK, excellent. Thank you. Question? Uh, kind of two questions. Mm -hmm. Your story was very engaging, and your speech patterns and things like that are very solid. So you've obviously done a lot of rehearsing both of the story and presentation as well as those patterns. Can you talk about both how you rehearse for story preparation and then also how you got there where you don't say on and hand and things like that every so often? Thank you. So the question was speech patterns, um, how much I practice and what I practice, and how I don't say um a lot. And I think I say that more than I think. So practice is interesting. Um, <laughs> practice is interesting because there are some things you want to practice a lot. There are things that I wanted to nail in a lot of those stories. Um, and some of them I did, and some of them I didn't. Um, to give you an example, in the story of the Game of Glider, the moment where all of the go-karts come racing back in. That's a key moment. And I wanted to make sure that I got that right. So I practiced that fragment of a sentence. I didn't practice the whole thing more than two or three times. And the main reason I did that was because I wanted to see how long it was. Now, I had that clocked in at about 45 minutes, but I left some things out. And I was a little bit nervous, so I went a little bit fast. And we'll get back to that. If you do too much practice, if you practice the whole thing start to end, you'll be a little bit stuck with practice, with, with what you practice, and that you'll only know how to do it start to end. And there are two pitfalls to that. The first is, if you get off the rails, it can be incredibly difficult to get back on. And the second is, you lose a little bit of spontaneity, and you, you, you lose a little bit of flexibility. And in that spontaneity and flexibility is a lot of the play that happens with your audience. So I need to be mindful of what you're doing. I need to be mindful of where you're laughing, where you're not, what noises you're making. I need to be mindful of when to pause so that people can finish laughing, that sort of thing. And if you're on rails, that can be very, very difficult to do. So it's useful to have some amount of plasticity in your practice, because that allows you flexibility when you're up here doing this thing. Now, not a problem with podcasting or vlogging, because you can, you can stop and start and do it again, and walk around the house and discuss it, and come back to the studio and all that. Um, but um, hopefully, I mean, one of the other things that's useful about a lot of this stuff is that you won't have to do that as much. Um, shucks, I think I forgot the last part of the question. How do you get there? Oh, yes. So, you said I wanted a little bit fast. Go as slowly as possible. No one will mind. Because part of the reason that we say, um, and this is part of the reason I'm standing up. When I'm standing up, I'm more comfortable. When I'm more comfortable, I calm down. When I calm down, I can go slowly, and I can start to do things with my voice like this. So go as slowly as possible. And it could be that that is dependent on the media. It could be that that is dependent on the format. You may only have five minutes. You may need to cram a whole mess of information into those five minutes. So it may not be slowly, but go as slowly as possible. It aids in retention. It helps your audience. And I think the thing mostly that it does is it keeps you from getting ahead of yourself. And particularly in a live situation, I'm worrying about a lot of things. But the main thing that I'm worrying about is the thing that I'm going to say next. If I'm talking very quickly, that's very difficult because I don't give myself time to prepare for the thing that's coming out of the thing that I'm saying right now. Unfortunately, you want to say, um, because it turns out, and I don't have, I'm, I'm, I'm very ill-prepared for this question, 
Um, but one of the things that has come up recently is that there have been some cognitive and perceptual studies about that particular phrase. And audiences have learned about that particular phrase and other particular phrases like them. Audiences have learned to expect them. And it doesn't bother them that much because it's information. When I go, um, I am letting you know that it's OK to take a break from all of the information that I'm giving you and stop and rest. And those little breaks are apparently very, very good for retention. They did studies on this. They said, OK, here's a speaker that's, that's talking and they have no vocal tics whatsoever. And people remembered what they said. And then they had the same speaker, an actor, who did the same presentation. They sprinkled it with ums and burrs and well and so and that. And people remembered more, which is really annoying. <laughs> <laughs> Particularly if you spend a lot of time trying not to do that. Um, <laughs> yeah, so, so did that answer your question? Yes. Excellent, thank you. Um, are there any other questions? You said your, your, your main career is in IT, so where is your love of stories and storytelling? Now I'm fascinated about that because that's one of my passions, is stories and storytelling. Various formats from the spoken word to the written word to visual to radio to especially old time radio. Some of it is that. Some of it is that. Um, old time radio, I'm just checking to make sure that we're not running over. We have about three minutes. Um, some of it is old time radio. There's a lot of great stuff. I grew up listening to The Shadow. Um, there, was, there was a lot of radio in my youth. Uh, it's like, and this is fascinating to me, this is a recent revelation that sports um, are stories. We have a narrative that is attached to sports. And the problem with sports is that they're also real life, so the narrative doesn't work out. We get very frustrated and we drink a lot. <laughs> but mostly it's just keeping your eyes open. And for some reason, I've started paying attention. And, and some of that is gather as many sources of stories as you can. Um, um, I, I grew up in a place where people would leave the New Yorker lying around. And the New Yorker is a, a really obnoxious magazine in a lot of countries. And for no other reason than it shows you all the things that are going on in New York that aren't happening here. <laughs> but one of the things that it has in it, which is remarkable, is um, the section in the middle of all these short little words, and they're all just absolutely fascinating. Like little things, tiny little things, none of which come to mind at the moment, and we've only got 120 seconds. But keep, keep your eyes open, keep your ears open. When you walk down the street, don't look at your feet. Look up. People stick things to walls for no reason that I understand. But I'll never notice them if I'm not looking at the walls and I won't find. And that's terrible advice, but that's all I have at the moment. And I apologize. <laughs> um, and, and I also apologize because I think we're out of time. Um, but uh, I, I, I'm sorry if you thought you were in the wrong room. And I hope it was reasonable, and I hope it was useful. Thank you.